When I was a kid, I used to be returned to Grand sometimes to spend the summer. The attic was full of Henty and Horatio Alger books. At the bottom of the back stairs hung my grandfather's pistol in a polished holster, looking so lethal I used to tiptoe past it. My grandfather was chief of the volunteer fire department and therefore merited a pistol, to shoot looters, I suppose, though I never saw him wear it. Then just above a pair of boots, huge enough it seemed to me to hide in, a sort of loose slicker dangled too, the emptied skin of a nigger. Once in a while the fire bell would ring in the ears of the church, and Grandfather would appear, clothed like a god, a great bright-bladed axe across his shoulders. Every child in town would run pell-mell after the firemen, who were easy to catch and even pass, because they were usually pulling a two-wheeled cart whose axle drum had hoses coiled like jungle snakes around it, or a pumper worked by hand like a seesaw, which was used to suck up dousing water from close wells. I particularly recall a fire which occurred in a small shoe repair store one misty morning. The bells rang, we kids flung ourselves like stones into the street, the firemen ran like horses, and the small store smoked like a pile of damp leaves. I was disappointed not to see flames, and I can remember watching both bewildered and amazed while my grandfather chopped holes in the roof, other men smashed the doors and windows, and still others wet everything and everyone, their hoses pissing languidly in realistic starts and stops, until the whole shop sagged and finally folded in upon itself as though it had been made of slotted cardboard. Of the actual fire, I never saw a lick. It was too elusive and escaped their Homeric wax. Morning fires never seemed real after that, an Indian signal sent up in a fog. These amateurs, these volunteers, didn't comprehend combustion, I thought, I felt someone should explain to them that flames weren't like the limbs of trees to be lopped off from their origins with an axe, however sharp the blade or strenuously swung. But, of course, I was far too shy. I was awed by the mysteries of the grown-up world at that age and kept my peace. So after an hour or two of heavy labor, when a pile of shattered boards half smothered in smoke lay charring weakly along the sidewalk, my grandfather announced the fire's official finish, and then we all stood around a while, wishing for something really incendiary, for more than smoke to mix in the mist, before letting go our hopes and going home. I knew the owner slightly, Czech, he was the only Jew in town. The creek, though, was as slow and glassy as grand itself was, and only when you put your hand in, or if you tossed a leaf upon the water, could you tell it was moving. Sometimes dust would shade it, and then the surface seemed a kind of skin covered with tiny webs and puckers, passing along like an unrolling roll of soiled wallpaper. Not even an occasional water bug could change your feeling that the bottom was imprisoned. The grocery store smelled of pickles, cheese, and open crackers, the creamery only of cream and churning butter and blue milk, though there were rows of gray-white eggs on which you should have sniffed the sea where all your made-up gulls had been. The butcher shop was redolent with blood and sausage spices, the bakery of yeast and warm bread and wax paper, the blacksmith shop of horses, leather, shade, and metal sizzled water. I should have expected from that burned-out store the reek of thongs and rubber, a smoke black as polish, the acetylene hiss of volatile oils. But it was all low and gray-headed, the smoke, 
carrying, as far as I could tell, only the odor of pissed-on paper. Later, I rescued a thin-headed hammer with blackened handle from the ruins, and I used it the remainder of that summer to set off giant caps, aiming blows which left red paper sticking to the sidewalk as though each bang had bled. Bill, he begins, what a Billy William I've become to Herschel. What a fall from William Frederick Kohler, Herr Professor, man of note. I hope you will, he says, in that big new book of yours. Herschel smiles like a thirty-watt bulb. He has no book, not even a little one. He has a wee M.A. from a weir school. The pity of others has tenured him, and he holds on by relaxing every grip. Assistant professor forever, teaching courses of the lowest number, shallow surveys of Western Civ, history as photoed from the moon. The world is full of Herschels, little sparse-haired, gray-eyed men who never make the news, even as a molecule in a mob. They pass through history like water through a comb. Literally, nothing is known of them. Bill, he begins, in your long one, Bill, I hope you will consider giving... How right he is, from Mad Meg's point of view, for it is the historian who gives, who takes and gives, while history itself just suffers and receives, as all my memories. Bill, he begins, Bill, I'm sure it'll be, ah, uh, great as it is large. Yes, he's smiling shyly, holding me by my name, as Tabor did, lest I get away. Could you consider giving giving the big men more weight, I mean, more attention, you know, than you did in your first. I felt Herschel feels it's indecent, as if he's undressing in my presence. I felt you were a trifle inclined then, though I may be wrong, yes, I probably am, but didn't you stress the common man a bit more than perhaps he? His voice goes out like a blown match. Poor Herschel, povero, povero, povero. Even in my books, he hopes he and his friends will remain unremarked and unremembered, that no one will recognize or record them, and it brings him to the fearful edge of criticism. He's a can of Dr. Scholl's, Deezer Armorman. I shall sprinkle him out. Little, small, common, like Culp, the Zizzler, so he ends. Piff poof, Herschel ends, ends Herschel. A sensitive Nazi at Auschwitz was annoyed by rabbinical outfits. These habits retard the melting of lard, which is the reason for being of Auschwitz. In the park, a grove of oaks and beeches with a bandstand. In the parlor, a piano with a lidded bench containing sheets of music, the trail of the lonesome pine, song of India, others. In the living room, long foaming sofas and a minuscule TV. I think I see black shapes on that glass ground. I give the screw a final twist and the dime flips from my hand, skips away, rolls away, ringing like my nerves. My wife will think a student's torn my shirt in her passion. They all have a passion for fat these days and want a man with a girlish bosom, nipples they can gnaw on, a belly they can pound and knead. Was your mother the passive partner in your parents' marriage? and the fat man's small cock hidden out of sight in his thighs, like the lady from Ghent who revealed when she bent. Oh, they want to wait to ride on, haw and gee, God damn them, and you too, Lou, you bitch, you bawd, you de-homered Helen, you soft, stuffed toy. Who rules more sternly than the teddy bear? Ahead of me in every feeling, wiser, 
dark and fair as a forest on a sunlit evening. What is all this shit about leaves and light? Innocent as a hanky, honest as Christmas wrapping, female faggot, fanny fucker, whore, nag, bore, bawd, bitch, Lou, you too, love, you. And in the park, a simple ceremony of maples, a single elm in the center like a fountain, and the lady fingers snapping rapidly, a cacciatura against the hootling of my father's cornet in Findlay's kilty band, as later in Ohio he bugled for the legion. I cannot breathe. It is too quiet. Then the scream, the groan. Which was it? I listened as I listened in the tunnel. No mistaking, a groan, a scream, a moan below me somewhere, down the empty steps, lit by their own laziness for safety. The rails precipitous, walls slick, paths of crushed rock trailing through the trees. A speech by the mayor about America, polite applause amid the cannon crackers, and the young girls with their asses on casters, boy-bottomed bodies I was mostly indifferent to, and unringing red bells in the ice cream. Bells, the flavor of strawberry, the size on slot machines, I carefully spooned around, I liberated, freeing them forever from vanilla. And young girls with cherry bombs between the tines of their thighs, and in their fists small flags fluttering down the steps to the floor below me, the building a riddle of worm halls, and the young girls with their crisp dresses dragging, and packs of dogs we scattered with grenades, girls flaunting their naked clothing. How silent the skin is, the flesh is growing. Popcorn, banners, parades below me. Someone is groaning, is unmistakably pained, and I listen to the oratory. I strain toward the sound, and with firecrackers send tin cans booming from the muzzle of my pipe-long mortar. I tilt the halls toward heaven like a battery of barrels. Pow! 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 Remember the glow and the smell of punk? the satisfying fizzle of the fuse, the stunned air after. There is no question, but those noises changed the color of the sky, shook it so it rained. My grandfather met the trains. The station smelled of creosote and timbers, and the rails were radiant all summer. On the bed of his truck, he hauled away huge crates made of fragrant, soft, cream-colored, fuzzy wood as nude as you were, as you calmly lay across the spread, awaiting me, and yet were moist and ready when I reached you. So I've seen some paintings of a beauty so supreme they drew the fingers to the pigments, not to touch their surface, but to sink inside them and had Christ walked within the water, I'd believe. Nor is there any better symbol for the single longing of my life than the penetration which your body begged and I supplied that single summer. And afterward remember how I trembled, trembled, for I knew, I knew I could go on no longer, could not continue, could not, could not, like a pond its water, hold these feelings as the light was held by the pines in our window, their arms around the ether. For me, for Newton, proof. Proof there was another medium through which at any time, if we were physical enough to be a spirit, we could feel, could enter, loo-like, free as a strawberry bell from vanilla forever. And on that night of breaking glass in Germany, when the windows of the Jews were being smashed, when I was caught up in the excitement, infected by the frenzy too, by the joyous running through the streets, until my arm was lifted and I hurled a brick myself, I thought of the flash of my grandfather's axe shattering the shingles of that poor Czech's roof, although my brick 
sailed through a jagged hole, I hope, and fell somewhere in the store without a sound. In fact, with so much silence that despite the hubbub in the neighborhood, I heard no groaning, heard no screams from any of my other selves, as after the girls with their heavenly haunches had stirred me, or that woman on wheels had, after all that labor on my work had worn me out, I heard them just below me in the building. I sat on the edge of the bed, yes, trembling, you remember. My belly sagged pathetically, and the rag rug rested my stupid feet. I remember and I have thin arms despite my weight. How could I believe in happiness? How could I, who loved you physically, believe in your love? Those perfect hands enclosing my imperfect penis, those slender fingers, pale tapered nails. They had to be the tools of a professional, a bawd. Those moist eyes and parted lips were lies. Lou, Weren't you supposed to be a bed tent, too, where I could hide as I hide in Herschel? How could I believe that if I squeezed it evenly, our new-laid love, like the egg, would demonstrate its strength? With thighs which widened when I sat like soft tires. No, it was simply too good to be, as the old saw says. Happiness has no friend in time, in history. It has no friend in me. Some prisoners cannot bear release, Lou. They've lived too long in climates of concrete. They know that happiness is just a priest who reads us words of consolation while we walk up the steps to the hangman. Yet we'd be suicides, without that low intoning, without silly things like flowers, sentimental hand clasps, helpless babies, the bodies which charm us. We are used to these. We demand them, as we expect foolery from a clown or deception from a magician. Would the condemned man know he was going if they came with whips, if they left behind in the office of the executioner the grave faces of the witnesses, the pleasantries of prayers, the dark dress, the black book beads. And so the Jews, who knew they were destined for death, death could scarcely have surprised them, could not believe in their own murders when managed in this manner. For such ceremony as they had come to count on was removed. It was so open, more matter-of-fact than even brutal, so fearless, honest, unemotional, so sincere, like spraying for mosquitoes. It so clearly transcended all excuse. It did away with reasons. On that splendid disdain for subterfuge they flew, the Nazis. Oh, hear me, Herschel, they rose as gods from the graves of their middle-class lives. Anointed, they left their little businesses behind, the normal world with all its petty laws for sainthood. These laws, these rules, these lies which lips at least for centuries had served, they did not need them. They were so self-contained, so internally secure. They were above even the ancient hypocrisies of heaven, and they lived in the realm of the spirit, of der Heilige Geist, as they'd been taught by their religions and philosophies. What were bodies, meat and bones to be disposed of? New grinders and new ovens, new gases and mass graves, as large as lakes, as long as rivers, a raw material calling for a new technology, new plants and processes, a fresh imagination, fresh inventions. What were bodies compared to principles, and what were principles compared to destiny, the Reich's will and history's aim? More theoretical, therefore, than most men, they did not dream, they saw, foresaw, they left the dreaming to the Jews who did, they dreamed like drummers marching at a cannon. The 1,000-year Reich 
was a state to be constructed just like happiness out of time, like the millennium of the Marxist. No angels from on high or demons from below with fiery swords or flaming forks came to balk them. Nature punishes gluttony, not avarice or hate. To nature, it's most important that you get a good night's sleep. No, only further murders, theirs, prevented them from murdering further as we flew bombers to Japan and powdered them to peace. God willing. I am sloppy, pudgy, like someone who has stuffed himself with sweets, a child, preserved in ice, the years blue-streaked and gleaming coldly. Thus, when I heard the groans below me, screams, groans, which, I quickly left my office and the building, fluttered like a moth down the stairwell, so slippery with light, and drove out of their hearing in my dodge. There once was, there once was, there once was, there once was, a young man from Crestline, a young man from Cleveland, a young... When I hear the bursting of the rockets, my hearing makes no noise. When I see the sky, my seeing's silent. Consciousness, just like the dead, is also quiet, so quiet. Am I any less indifferent and a coward if the voice I failed, the moan I ran from, was a phantom, was my own? My brick passed through that window like a ghost. I never heard it land. I was simply never fated to break glass. That's why, Lou, I couldn't continue us. And that's why windows are important to me. Blackboard I understand that nowadays some of them are even green. Mine were made of slate and washed each night after the erasers had been clapped. Chalk would sometimes cause the board to scream as if it had been cut to the quick. I would say to the class, now we know that the distinction I've been making is truly carving reality at the joints. Even this weak witticism would return a smile to their pained faces. Sometimes, impatient to correct, I would simply wipe a word away with a sweep of my hand, the side white then, as if it were the glove on a clown. Three spaces matter in my life. They are my trinity, the pane of the window, the white of the page, and the black of the board. I would like to have said the body of my beloved, but I can't. As a student, I stared at it while the teacher was talking. As a teacher, I turned to it whenever I am at a loss for words or when I want to make a point get a thought included in the student's notes, even when I want to examine the fundamental field of some mental calculation. As useful as it is in these several ways, none of them is the source of its fascination for me. The board is at once the surface of a pit-black sea and a bleak opening unto all our inner spaces. It is the brink of what we are, and hence a horror. Nevertheless, it is so simple, unassuming, so solid as a symbol, that the feeling it gives me is one of reassurance, because the blackboard is made of dynamic distances, yet its locations run in place, unlike a window, which is always full of the flitter of images, and unlike the page, which is flat and unmusical, slow to change, often indelible, its purity slick and shiny, its invitation easy and shallow. Furthermore, paper and glass are fragile, while the board is a piece of stone, brittle perhaps, but redoubtably hard, its layers of primeval mud, earliest sand and volcanic dust, compressed by the weight of mountains for a million years. 
whereas the chalk, like it, an element of earth, is almost talc-soft, lime-like, and sedimentary. May I prefer to think of the minute remains of marine animals, although those creatures shaped the cake cliffs, I guess, and not the little pencils of powder with which I draw the Kaiser's family tree or spell out Deutsches Nachrichten Bureau on the board. To me, the board has always been profoundly three-dimensional, an effect enhanced by the chalk dust which drifts up from the tray or is inadequately removed when the slate is washed so that its normal blue-black monochrome is full of subtle variations, grays which suggest faraway galaxies or a nebula's gaseous clouds. And when I began to draw a line across a freshly cleaned section, my hand follows the chalk in as though, like fish, it swam there. And then in the curve of an encircled word, it returns toward its source, and the simpler surface of the classroom world. That may be one reason why I lose my way while spelling the most common terms, for the letters will not remain in a row on the same plane as they do on the page, but sink or rise or float away, becoming curlicues and bows of string, whorls of suspended weed, in which I lose all sense of the word's original identity. This almost wet night is what I see when I close my eyes and wait for the afterimages to recede. It is the theater of consciousness. Here music makes its notes form phrases in a foreign tongue, unintelligible but meaningful. Here all my thoughts parade and pictures hang. Here I set my dreams. I am sure everyone has such a hollow in their head, and I imagine each has an importance to its owner that's equal to mine. But I should be surprised if anyone else looks at a blackboard and sees there a minefield, one's arena of empty awareness, waiting whatever thoughts the brain will bring it, whatever perceptions the world will share, feelings the body will provide words and lines and illustrations, and where the traces of long erased desires still lie like shadows beneath an overlay of public chalk. For two decades the blackboard has stood stolidly before me, and for three more it has mostly stood silently behind. I've pulled down maps like shades across a pane, or occasionally colored areas of it in, green or pink or yellow, and a movie screen a time or two has shown triumph of the will or some Dachau to Auschwitz footage. I have dealt in that time with cracked boards and surfaces somehow permanently stained with puffs of pale gray dust like a badly silvered mirror and had to wipe away the traces of another discipline with inadequate erasers. Once I even used, with comical success, a few logical computations left over from a class in baby logic. What a familiar annoyance it was to look down at the chalk tray and see only nubbins lying like butts in their ash. I remember the fingered holders which drew staffs like a rake across sand and pieces of frayed string with which one swung arcs and almost completed circles. There were T-squares and triangles, too, back in my grade school days, when notices and the names of those to be kept after school were printed in less used upper corners and left there all day to remind and reprove within line-enclosed fields marked, Save. Der Klassenzimmer, my little hall of holding forth, my lectern dial, my minds to mold, my self-infatuated space, my schoolroom, with, in the early days, its rows of bolted and then, when the libertarians took over slightly askew chairs, 
has to be my habitat, my thicket of concealment, my nesting place. I have lived much of my life in its predictable atmosphere, the faintly run-down, gently untidy look such rooms customarily have, the light which always pours in from the windows, which invariably open up one side, as if the building were tipped, and the overhead globes coloring it a bit, so that classroom illumination has its own jaundiced mix. And how well I know the tattered blinds, too, crooked and chipped, the long scuffed wall opposite the windows where the corridor goes, broken only when the room reaches its uninteresting end, against which the blackboard in the next classroom rests by the customary access door and pane of frosted glass, a dark number in the middle of its business, like the ID on an athlete. There are generally three of those oak crate, shellac yellow, one-armed, paddle-heavy chairs on either side of a central aisle, which might run eight rows back. Forty ninnies and eight wise guys, we always said. But proper design had decreed that no student was to be seated very far to the left or right, nor should the center be too deep, despite the fact that eye contact was the only kind officially permitted, even though the front rows were always the last filled and were where I hoped girls with negligent thighs would try to balance their books, comb their hair, and take notes at the same time. It would be natural for me to feel comfortable in these surroundings, to feel a certain affection for my tools, even to become aware of them only in a subliminal way, or use them up without any appreciation of their individuality, and cast them aside for others, as when a piece of chalk breaks and you unfeelingly slip a fresh stick from the box, or when you let your lines pass cracks without a thought for the slate's age or condition or eventual fate. Are they ground up, I wonder? Because the chalk wears out its life against the board, and its dusty powder is pressed into the packing of the eraser, only to be buffeted loose in a bash of clapping and carried off by a dispersing breeze. So, when pounding erasers, it is wise to extend the arms and stand well in the lee. Although I used to bang them so fiercely against the walls of the school or the cement of the walks, when I was sent to clean them as a kid, they made prints as if by strange feet or prints as if by strange palms. And it was then that the chalk would break up into particles individually blown away or worn off by the wind, bits which were a moment before the track of some weird beast, and before that, perhaps, an atom in the makeup of a word, a word which might have served a thought, even named a style or an era or a system. For the appearance of a mark in the space of the slate was only temporary. Little I knew was more so, except perhaps what lovers penciled in the sand with a stick or their fingers, baking their bodies first in the sun and next in one another's, then inscribing their names at the beach's edge and waiting for the onrushing water to cleanse them of a connection they did not realize they were ready to renounce. Or perhaps what the skywriters wrote in the sea beach sky itself, the names of products and passions both dissipating like an outcry of birds against an incessant surf. Chalk was made to be removed. The board was built to remain. Its world was a world of erasure and revision, of outlines and summaries and unfamiliar names, not even what was penciled onto paper was expected to vanish precisely because it was put there. And I loved that about its space, that life limit, so that even an enclosing line, even the plea of save, would not preserve a mark much longer than a day, nor was it a place for first notes, rather for last ones, since few thoughts 
found themselves constructed in its yard. No, it was a realm of reminder, a place to announce, an idea, to encapsulate a period, to make a joke, to write Heil Hitler, hardly witty, on what the students called the billboard, though they thought I didn't know, and then to wait for the teacher to wipe away a sign, a slogan with a wet rag, or that shout they had never heard seriously shouted to remove it from public sight and the arena of nervous regard. The students are also amused by my habit of clapping my own hands to get the dust off, of leaning back against the slate and streaking my ass with chalk or whitening the edge of a coat sleeve as my arm smears what my fingers scribble. There are even distinctions to be made between those like Plan Mantee, who erase primly back and forth, not exceeding greatly the marks to be eliminated, and those who, like Governale, employ a motion as broadly circular and thrashy as history itself. Or those like Herschel, who swipe gingerly at their adversary and end only by placing a gray fog over every easily reachable area. Mad Meg paced, even scooted, while he talked, whereas I tend to drape myself rather heavily over the lectern or my back to the board, timidly inch along the edge of the chalk tray, causing, of course, that amusing line to be drawn. These quirks are regarded by the students as endearing, and one more irrelevancy they can focus on while the central issue blurs and the point in question blunts. What I wonder at is the way in which such objects assume an enormous significance in my life. They are like catch basins and would collect me if I were rain. It is in these places that I find myself again, as if the image in the water were really made of water and were really in the puddle where it seems to be. Proust's little shell-shaped cake reminded Proust of pages but all that M remembers hurries him farther away from that smell, that taste, the tea time that started it off toward earlier circumstances, other days, each as different from the source of their recall as button from bell. Nor would one ever find in Odette's perfume the haunt of the Madeleine's odor, or in poor Swan an appreciation of its smell. I assume we all associate, if none of us do it as well, moving along old tracks from place to place in our past, like a memory-driven train, but history, as I especially feel it, deposits itself inside its surroundings, in objects unlike actions which are marked by being almost immediately over, in things which hang around the way the corpse does after the hanging's done as the earth does over the criminal's grave, and the rope itself which feels its own burns in abraded places. In things, unlike thoughts, which shed their individuality and immediately swim away into anonymity, becoming so many figures, so many fish, so many electromagnetic waves. In my mother's rings, my aunt's nested boxes, my father's car, in the dregs of every day where my life composts itself, rots, warms, blends, bursts into flame. In a photograph, a dollop of honey, bit of burnt toast, or in all other toasts and dollops which seem identical, although how many honeys have been licked from Lou's navel, in uncapped tubes of toothpaste, in rhyme on grass and leaves, in, in short, things seemingly trivial, things set aside or overlooked, things apparently passing which nevertheless abide in either themselves or their duplicates. Only in such debris, however, as has been made over from matter into mind, because one is never carried away out of the neighborhood of these redolent things, but is rather drawn into them, enters them carrying a torch or wearing a light as into a mine, 
so that everything a blackboard does to remind me of my childhood, my pupil days, or my profession, tells me about the blackboard, too, tells me about chalk and me, geometry and me, erasers and dull walls and windows and me, swastikas and myself, concerning both I've more than once made a clean slate. For history, I do believe, is not a mighty multitude of causes whose effects we suffer now in some imaginary present. It is rather that the elements of every evanescent moment endeavor to hitch a ride on something more permanent, living on in what lives on, lengthening their little life by clinging to a longer one. And in that manner, though perhaps quite unintentionally, attaching what will be to what still is, and so far has survived, the way a word's former employments are the core of what it presently means. Because a word's history is what the word is, its future an incrustation like a cloak of bark, and lurking beneath its present use, holding it up into the light of nowadays, is the Hercules of all it's been. For if you were a little cloud of clapped dust, though you were to know that the matter you are made of is eternal, it helps you not at all, as a cloud already dissipating as a cloud does, to continue to exist. No, you must somehow entrance the eye of your Creator, be realized and remembered in a mind, be indeed a pesky cloud about to blow back over your clapper's hands and arms and hair, and hence into the memory of a retreating step, a sneeze, a fanning of the hand, into a memory to which its link with language may one day bring you back, perhaps at the sight of another pat of powder, a puff like the puff you'd been before, before you became an expression, an image, and therefore understood on this fresh occasion which you now invest, to be the dust of a few wiped-away words, returning to the nowhere from whence they came, to be the residue of all such words, written where writing is fugitive, to be the ash of speech itself, the fate of whatever said, since to be airborne is to be powder like a cloud. And then, of course, to mark the persistent mutability of all things, of matter whose forms are famously protean, of mind which must find an ear to speak in, or the space of a page or a slate on which to write. Write what? Those meanings which must await a breath, or have to live in lines of ink, or must trust their fate to a stick of chalk. Yet walk away in a student's rented head, some day maybe to be an accomplished mind. Consequently, as the blackboard clouds and screeches its umlauted vowels, I can still see there, beneath fresh scribble and old smear, the parallelograms and triangles I have drawn while trying to prove a theorem for Miss Mason, the middle-aged old maid who taught me geometry in fifth grade and who opened and closed doors with a hanky held in her hand to protect herself from her pupil's germs. So when I lean on the lectern on some first day and speak to my class, these students, this space, this podium, the chairs, the rows, the room, the scattered stacks of books and papers, the gloomy, eager, drowsy faces, the slightly soiled floor, the oddly tempered light, moted by the dust the students' shoes have stirred. The blackboard I know is behind me, black as space without a star, and empty as emptiness never quite is, awaiting as they are, as I am, the beginning of our course, a course through a cursed time, that is to say, awaiting words, certain words, words I shall have said before, then all other and aforetime books and desks and faces and floor and dust-flocked air and lips and hair and light eyes are there too, roomed as well as we, seated sweetly, 
uneasily, wearily, not as some external recollection to be pasted to the present class, but as the sense and center of what I and we and these things are, and so the clue to what these things we and I will do. For my present self, my slouchy figure, is but another use of me in the many sentences which compose a time. And so it is for the students here who have found their place once more in the syntax of the schoolroom. And if you know the sort of sentences we have performed in before, the way you know the words of your language, then you will know what we here altogether mean. But if you know only Cynthia, Frank, and Mary, and who knows so much, and cannot recognize or read the rest, then welcome to history, a text where possibly every thirtieth word seems clear. Historical attention is like needle and thread going in and out of the holes of a button fastening A to B only by passing through both many times, for first the blackboard is a thing and then a sign, and then the sign's a thing again with that self-same sign inside, and then a sign once more before it sees itself become slate space, chalk cloud, word world, my public scratch pad, lecture points, my miseries in math class, the great graffito caper, Miss Mason's bare ass depicted sticking out a window, her slow erasure of the image, the remnants of the lines, however, all the more bawdy, all the more eloquent, and then her spitting on the traces, spitting and wiping with her hand, spitting while standing kiss close to the stone, spitting hard as if expelling a bug with her food, while we watch in a silence bluer and more brittle than the board, finally turning to face us, only her soiled hand shaking, standing, staring straight over our heads before saying, finally, 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 Open your books to page 84. In true history, word, thing, thought, and memory are bound then like a buttoned button to a sleeve with a little thread left over for the deed. My eyes turn to the board as they once did when I sat in class and dreamed, entering outer space, passing systems of stars in a blink, or imagining regions of the world which awaited their maps to be finally real, or drawing with my mind's eyeline the belovedly rendered buttocks of Miss Mason over and over until there was nothing to see there but ocean, nothing but waves. <laughs>